Hello, everyone. We're going to get started. Thank you for being with us today. I'm Tanya Gross, and I'm the Director of Educational Programs for the Open Textbook Network. I'm joined today by my colleague, Karen Lordson, Director of Publishing for the OTN. I'm excited to welcome you to this monthly OTN webinar. This uh, month's webinar is about OER Learning Circles, facilitated by Dr. Karen Pakula instructor of psychology at Central Lakes College in beautiful Brainerd, Minnesota within the Minnesota state system. So with that, Dr. Pakula, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, and as a reminder, we're recording this. Okay, thank you, Tanya. And thanks for asking me to um, share my ideas today with um, your group of participants. I'd like to welcome you to this um, webinar. And also thank you for taking time from your busy day to attend. Today I'll be sharing some information with you on a process that I have created for facilitating, facilitating faculty work on adopting and creating open educational resources um, for faculty to use in their courses. I'd like to first share a little bit of history with you and background on the, how the learning circles originated and the creation of the model that I use. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, kill the video on this just while I present and then when we get done, um, I will put it, uh, open that back up. So, let's see. I'm trying to get this to advance here. It worked the last time I did, just did this with, there we go. Okay, so just a little bit of history on this. This uh, process or model started at the institutional level. Um, it actually has its origins in the OTN slide deck and webinar that was created by David Ernst, who's the director for the Center for Open Education and the executive director of the Open Textbook Network. Many of you are probably already familiar with what I call the OTN 101 webinar and slide deck. David created both to serve as an agent to raise awareness about open educational resources and the Open Textbook Library and the Open Textbook Network. He also manages the Open Textbook Library, which is a single repository for storing and making available high quality, openly licensed textbooks. My learning circle model really began with the January 2014 in-service day at our college where Dave Ernst and Gary Hunter, who is a system director for intellectual property at Minnesota State, and then Todd Digby, who was then the Minnesota State OER coordinator, gave uh, Dave's presentation to us as a group of faculty. Uh, Gary also presented additional information on the Creative Commons licenses. I would just love to tell you today that I decided to, to move to OER that day to save my students money. But the truth of the matter is that I decided then and there that I was moving to OER for one main reason, academic freedom. I could visualize the wonderful opportunities that these OER could give to me in creating learning resources that I could adapt to meet the diverse needs of all of my students, resources that would fit into my teaching style and my, match my teaching philosophy, and resources that I could organize in a manner that I had always wanted to. This presentation on OER to faculty by the system office and the Open Textbook Network members on that faculty duty day started my own personal journey with Open Textbook Library and OER reviews and then adoption. At our institution, it will also initiate the creation of our OER committee. As other CLC faculty members, Central Lakes College is where I work, and as other faculty members started to participate in the system-sponsored um, um, open textbook network reviews, um, our committee started to work with those faculty who had reviewed OER. And we knew that we wanted to move further ahead with implementing OER at our institution. So then we applied for um, a system grant and we were awarded the grant. And that's where the learning circle process really started. It was a key component of the grant that we wrote and was implemented then. 
At the institutional level, the Learning Circle process served as an organizational structure for the review of OER courses using OER and the authoring of OER, which actually ultimately led to Central Lakes College being able to offer the first post-secondary, public post-secondary AA degree in Minnesota. Boy, I'm having a problem getting these to advance. Let's try this. Okay, so um, another part of this history really is where um, I was then hired by Minnesota State after we'd run the learning circles at Central Lakes College for a couple of years. Um, I had been talking to Kim Johnson at um, Minnesota State about how easy I felt this could be um, scaled up to the system level. So Minnesota State then hired me as their OER faculty development co coordinator um, to scale this process up to the system level. And this model um, is really has its roots in uh, much of the research that I did for my dissertation. I was in that, um, in my work for my dissertation, I was looking at data that I had gathered from novice teachers when I asked them what their perceptions were on how well they were able to transfer what they had learned in their teacher training courses to performance in the classrooms. I learned some very interesting things about how we train our new teachers and their perspectives on how we could improve that process. My study found that teacher training programs need to be restructured to provide those learners opportunities to learn content from qualified instructors who have had recent and relevant classroom experience at the grade level that their students are seeking licensure. They need opportunities to apply the content in ongoing authentic classroom situations as they are learning the material and they need the opportunities to reflect and collaboratively discuss those experiences with peers, instructors, classroom mentors, and their advisors immediately after those experiences. And so the experiential learning theory of David Kolb involves learning from experience. That um, theory proposed by Kolb takes a more you know, holistic approach and emphasizes how experiences, including cognition, environmental factors, and emotions influence the learning process. I also wanted to include these concepts in my model, ensuring that, um, that those instructors are those faculty that would be working with OER had concrete and relevant uh, learning experiences where they had opportunities to reflect and conceptualize about their learning experience with colleagues um, while that was happening. And as I created the learning circle process, the thoughts about my findings from my study and Kolb's um, experiential learning theory really guided a good um, share of my work. And then also when we're looking um, at the learning circle model, many of those same elements from my model also align with key elements um, that are components of um, educator efficacy. Professional integrity, authentic assessment and reflection, content and pedagogical knowledge, collaborative learning communities, diverse learners and diverse experiences. And we know that efficacy refers to teachers' confidence in their ability to bring about success from all students, resting really on a belief that when teachers believe, students can achieve. One thing that I see in every learning circle is how faculty that begin working with OER and collaborating and sharing ideas, thoughts, and challenges and successes began to regain confidence in themselves as educators and as experts in their fields. For too many years, I think, educators have paid a lot of money making themselves experts in their fields, and then they have slowly started to believe that commercial textbook publishers are the experts, and somehow they've kind of lost their way. As they work with colleagues and they search for and work with open resources, they begin to regain their confidence as experts in their field. 
and their ability to look at their course objectives, their students and their students' needs, their needs, and to design quality courses and learning experiences for their students. Some of the key elements of the Learning Circle model are also seen in models of inclusive teaching. Professor Christine Hawking's comments on the results of research on inclusive learning and teaching in higher education, she defines inclusive, inclusion and inclusive teaching this way. She says that teaching that engages students in learning that is meaningful, relevant, and accessible to all it embraces a view of the individual and of individual difference as a source of diversity can enrich the life and learning of others. And as you can see in this Venn diagram, it shows so nicely how inclusion becomes central to the creation of learning objectives that take into account students' diverse needs. The learning circle model is intentionally designed to allow for flexible instructional styles that can remove barriers and also offer the opportunity for faculty to create resources that are accessible and inclusive and reflect course learning outcomes that align with faculty's chosen methods of assessment. One way that I do this is to schedule presentations by experts in these areas every other week in our virtual face-to-face -face learning circle meetings. And often these experts are our own college and university faculty from across the state. So now when we look at the actual learning circle process, I can't say enough about how much this has to be and should be a librarian and faculty driven initiative. Um, the learning circle process increases faculty awareness of OER opportunities it increases the adoption of OERs. Um, for faculty that att attend the learning circles for all the three what I call pathways, um, faculty have to attend 80% of the scheduled learning circle meetings. Um, and faculty are required to create and submit and update weekly work plans and journals. So in week one, I have faculty um, take a blank template that I've created and they create a tentative work plan week one. In week one, they put where they are right now. Week 10, they put where they want to be. And then in the intervening eight weeks, they fill in um, a work plan based on the knowledge about who they are and how they work, their family commitments, um, their community commitments, all the other things that they know enter in their life they know best how they learn and how they work and how they get things done. So they create a plan based on that for themselves. And um, they submit that plan to me um, every week with a journal. Um, there's a template with that has a, the plan and the journal, everything is in one template. Every week I require that they journal just some of their thoughts and feelings, any um, websites or whatever that they want, want for, might want for future use. Um, are all journaled in that week plan. And then they submit that to me every week just before we meet for learning circles. I go through those plans and comment on them and then we discuss much of that in the face-to-face -face learning circles. And then at the very end of our 10-week um, session, faculty present their final re results to the other colleagues um, in their cohort and um, so share their successes and ideas with them. Participants are paid a stipend um, in the learning circles, whether it's at the institutional or the system level. Um, when we're talking dollar figures um, at the institutional level, they're paid somewhere between two to $500 for reviews. And then for course redesigns and authoring, um, uh, on the authoring pathway, they're usually paid a stipend of about $1,500. At the um, system level, that is um, about 0.5 release credit, then that would depend on um, each faculty member's um, years of service or whatever their base wage is. And there, for the learning circles, there is an application process both at the system level and the institutional level. Insti uh, interested faculty apply to attend the learning circles. 
Um, at the institutional level, the OER committee reviews applications and announces the successful applicants. At the system level, um, the OER coordinator and the program director for educational development review the applications and announce successful applicants. Much of the scoring criteria on the rubric are the same, but today I'm gonna to kind of focus on the general criteria for the system level applications. The only difference really is that at the institutional level, each institution will have goals specific to where their institution is in developing an OER initiative at their institution. And those goals unique to that institution will influence the scoring criteria um, for their scoring rubric. So uh, for example, um, we, we kind of look um, at the system level if a course is needed for a Z degree because we're really promoting Z degrees across Minnesota State right now. And that's also what we did look at at the institutional level. Um, we check if the score course is scheduled to be taught in the next academic year if it has high enrollment, which we uh, feel is greater than 50 students per year. Um, if that faculty is new to OER learning circles, if we have um, too many people apply and we have to kind of decide who can go, um, we will give priority to those faculty who have not had an opportunity to attend a learning circle. Um, we look at whether the application sustains the current OER course. Uh, we look at the current cost of textbooks, savings to students if the course is redesigned as an OER course. We look at how our redesign, um, how that faculty member tells us their redesign will benefit students and how it will benefit other Minnesota State faculty. We check if the course is a developmental ed course because we, are, we collaborate with some other departments within Minnesota State who actually fund um, special send us some special funding for faculty that are developmental ed and want to um, adopt an OER. We consider the content area. If we've already uh, have a lot of courses in one content area and we don't have many in another, we will try to give priority um, to those that we don't have a lot of so we can get a more well-rounded um, repository of resources. And then we look at the um, ancillary, if they might be um, creating ancillary materials, if they complement an ex um, existing open textbook, how is like in the um, OTL or um, BC open textbook collection or um, another repository. And I just want to mention again, the importance of collaboration in this process. The Learning Circle model does provide the opportunity for interactive support and collaboration for faculty as they work through each of the three pathways. Support and collaboration from the Learning Circle facilitator and from their institution's librarian or the system level librarian. Um, or librarian, um, we actually have, you know, like a group of librarians that will work together um, that have uh, and then sometimes also we include those um, folks that have done the Creative Commons licensure certification, which is really important as well. Dear Karen, yes. um, is there a limit on how many times a faculty member can participate in the learning circle or a limit on the number of times they can receive a stipend for participating? Actually, we have not done that at all. We have, I think this learning circle, which is our fifth learning circle, um, cohort since I started. We just started that last week. I think I have a person in that one who's actually attended four learning circles. And I have another one that's attended three. So if we have room, we, they, can all, they can still attend. It's just that if we have just a limited number of, we can find just a limited number of spaces, then we will ask those folks if they would, you know, wait until another learning circle and then let someone who hasn't attended in. But at this point, we have not limited that. And it's really good that we haven't because those folks that um, have been successful in there, I mean, we have one gentleman now who is working on his fourth textbook. So it really does um, help them get that work done. And we'd like to see that work getting done even if it's being done by someone who's already been in there. And thank you for that. And can you give us an idea how big each circle is and how many circles there are at each institution? Okay, so right now at the system level, um, I, we have some um, 
we have a few institutions institutions trying to run some individual learning circles but at the system level we have uh, members our, our participants from institutions all across the state so we usually try to limit it to 25 participants per learning circle and then we still have room for those five developmental ads so we would probably max it at about 30. but right now um, typically we've run somewhere between 17 and 25 participants per learning circle but these are faculty from many different institutions all across the state and are there oftentimes many who aren't uh, who aren't selected but apply? I don't think we've, I think one time we had three people that had already um, done a learning circle. So we asked them to wait for the next session. Otherwise we've been pretty lucky to have just, we've been just getting around 25 people applying at a time. Perfect, thank you. So then um, looking at the three pathways at the institutional level, level um, when we ran them at Central Lakes College, we had a review pathway, we had a course redesign pathway and an authoring pathway. And at the system level, um, we have three pathways as well, but we really um, don't do the review pathway because we um, do the OTN um, webinars in place of the review pathway and have our faculty across the state participate in the OTN um, webinar reviews. We, um, we do course uh, redesign at the system level. We do the authoring um, of OER materials, both ancillary and textbooks. And then our third pathway at the um, system level is the learning circle leaders pathway, where faculty who have already attended a learning circle and want to start learning circles at their institutions work with me um, in the role of a learning circle leader and get the opportunity to, um, to do all of the things that I do in Learning Circle um, while we're doing it and in place of me. So it's much like teaching practicum, almost like student teaching. They come in and they um, lead the Learning Circles, they do the grading, they read the pearls and discussion, they give feedback, they learn how to do all of that. And then I give them a, um, a I import a demo course room for them to create their own D2L um, Brightspace support course room for their um, learning institution. And on the review pathway, um, it's, this is kind of how it works that, and, and this is real um, similar, all three pathways, there's just a few differences. Um, faculty work in those facilitated cross-disciplinary collaborative learning circles with other faculty members. They share ideas and support each other. On the review pathway, I usually only run that for five weeks, um, but they also have to attend 80% of the scheduled learning circle meetings. They also complete a work plan. They complete a, a textbook comparison template and a review rubric, which I use the BC Campus Criteria Checklist. A lot of these things that I have them complete are, I have created nine templates that faculty can use to really guide and organize um, their work as they adopt open educational resources or they create them. And then um, at the end, again, um, faculty share the, the results of their reviews with um, the big, um, we call it like a showcase event at the end of the um, learning circle, our 10th learning circle, we all share the results of our work. And the redesign pathway, once again, um, they work in those cross-disciplinary um, collaborative learning circles. They attend 80% of the scheduled meetings. Uh, for this, these, this session and the authoring session, they create a 10-week work plan. Um, they uh, create, if they're doing a course redesign, they either redesign the course in a demo D2L course shell, or they use my uh, learning objective matrix and they create, it's a template and they create their entire course in that learning objective matrix. And I have one um, nursing instructor who teaches grad level nursing courses as well. And she has created all of her course redesigns. She's doing another one um, this semester uh, in that learning circle um, 
matrix. And so it, it really is a nice way to organize everything um, in, a, in a, uh, a format that can be easily um, copied into a um, digital format. They uh, once again attend the showcase event and share their materials with all of the CLAT course mates and then they um, license their uh, course materials with a Creative Commons license. And the offering pathway is very much the same. Um, they do the same 80% 10-week plan. Um, I do ask them to download the authoring guide from BC Campus and look through that because whether they're authoring a textbook or they're authoring um, ancillary materials, there's some really great um, guides, uh, guiding principles in that guidebook. And I think um, Tanya, have you and um, Karen, don't you also have an authoring guide now from Open Textbook li uh, Network Library? I'm not sure, but I think you've Karen worked on Karen says something. yes, we do. Yes. So I will add that in as, um, as, as one that uh, my faculty can use as well. Um, and they, um, they also share at the end. And then we have them at Minnesota State, their resources now are um, housed in a repository that we call Opendora. Um, so all of the um, courses, the ancillary materials um, are housed in Opendora. Also many of our um, faculty have um, requested to have their materials housed in the open textbook library at the University of Minnesota and um, many of our faculty have things there as well. So then alongside of the um, face to, uh, fa virtual face-to-face -face meetings every week that we have the Learning Circle meetings, I've created a Brightspace D2L course room um, where fa really faculty um, have access to a lot of um, the, I structure it just like a D2L course. So for each pathway, there's a, um, a module for that pathway and underneath that module, there's uh, 10 sub modules for each week of the learning circles. Uh, there are links to all of their drop boxes, um, discussions, whatever in there, just like we would have in a regular D2L course room. I have within that D2L course room, I have a repository of resources. I have universal design links. I have QM support links, case studies, um, organizational structure for in which faculty can work. And um, it gives them an opportunity to share and discuss pearls, which are like aha moments our aha findings um, from their individual experiences each week in a discussion forum. And then faculty also use those pearls um, to start their discussion when we have our face-to-face -face learning circles. And one of the amazing things that we discovered, even though um, the learning circles are designed to address accessibility, equity, and diversity, um, because I schedule every other week those expert presenters um, to present on different topics addressing these issues, um, I knew that faculty probably were gonna be aware of it and addressing it to some degree. But what we were really surprised at when we had our first showcase event is that how much faculty were addressing these issues um, and making it just a priority in their courses to make sure that these issues were addressed. And here are some examples of some of the things um, where we found that faculty had really gone over and above board to um, make sure that they were addressing these um, issues. We had three new textbooks that were created. Um, one of our course redesigns also um, turned into a textbook. And that is something I'm finding more and more in these uh, latter four um, cohorts that I've run is that faculty tend to do a course resign, redesign, and I would say a good share of them, probably 40% of them doing a course redesign, end up at the end actually creating a textbook for that course by the time they're done. Um, these are some of the courses that re were redesigned. Um, so it just shows that there's a wide variety of cor courses 
um, even in the arts that are being redesigned. Um, another thing was, of course, redesign ended up with that instructor redesigning the course and keeping uh, creating a chemistry lab manual, which is extremely valuable to faculty that teach chemistry. And then here's just some examples of many of the ancillary materials that our faculty have been creating to go along with the open um, educational resources that are already available out there. Many of them from OpenStax and many of them from the Open Textbook Library. So as you can see, it's not just like test banks and PowerPoints, but there's all kinds of things that are being um, created and there's many things that are being created um, that are um, in a digital format as well. And some of the additional benefits of, um, of the learning circles that we found, just these are kind of come from faculty's um, input and feedback to us after the learning circles. At the end of the learning circles, we have faculty do what we call a pay it forward guide. And um, they answer some questions for us that I'm, I'm pulling together in a spreadsheet and we're gonna create a pay it forward guide for faculty members that are unfamiliar with OER. And these are ideas and thoughts from the faculty that have attended learning circles and have worked with OER on how new faculty to this arena can save some time and um, effort. What we have found is there's been a great collaboration between uni universities and colleges and new networks of um, communication there that we hadn't seen previously, which we're really excited about. Um, between faculty and learning circles and faculty uh, in departments across the state, we've seen faculty really that are in learning circles really reach out to faculty across the state in their same discipline or department um, and engage in conversations that they hadn't before. Uh, and also interdepartmental consulting on projects and peer review. We've had many faculty just go back after a couple weeks in the learning circles and ask faculty in their departments to help them peer review their um, project as they're working on it. It also really, um, I will address again about the personal professional growth and development and how faculty begin to regain confidence in their own professional expertise. This is just a, a quote that I, I took, um, copied and pasted from one of the pearls that someone had posted in um, their weekly discussion area. And she said, this is a crazy tool. I have learned so much. I have been able to start a few academic play papers plus pull from old drafts I have to work on a chapter on style. I didn't know this OER textbook project was going to help my career so much. And she mentioned that many times um, throughout the semester about how much it had helped her in her um, professional writing and whatnot beyond um, her OER work. Karen, can you some another collab Karen? Yep. Could you tell us where the ancillary materials are housed by any chance, please? Okay, so those are, we, as you know, we just really got Opendora up and functioning and it's still, we're still getting some kinks out of Opendora. Mm -hmm. um, but starting in January, we have started to go back to all of the faculty that have developed things. A lot of the things I actually hold um, in files and the faculty hold in files and I have all of them in my learning circle of course rooms. But we're asking faculty now that the process is kind of smoothed out to go in and load those into Opendora. And so in Opendora as well, there's some, um, there are some uh, safeguards in place to, pre, um, to preserve the integrity of say test banks. Um, to this point, we've just kind of, uh, it's just been kind of word of mouth that faculty have created those test banks or they have those resources out there. We've just been kind of waiting for this open door. Also, some of the things are being housed um, at OpenStax and the Open Textbook Library as they're creating them for existing um, textbooks. Thank so you. I think if they, if they um, meet your criteria for things being submitted to the Open Textbook Library, um, some of those things have been, um, are being stored there as well. An open door right now is only open um, statewide to Minnesota State faculty. 
But our goal is to open that up um, to a broader audience as soon as we have it running smoothly. Anything else, any other questions, Tanya? Um, there's a bunch of questions about whether you're willing to share your slides, which I already know you are with the CC license, but um, your templates and stuff, but we can talk about that at the end, kind of what we might be able to send out. Okay, sounds good, yes. So I just wanna to touch on another collaboration because um, when we're talking about um, this learning circle model and, and really um, the importance of OER, not just for um, post-secondary students, but we think about our um, collaborations with our concurrent enrollment high school faculty. At Central Lakes College, we received another grant from NJPA. And we actually have done three years now, that grant just ran out, but we ran three years of learning circles between our college faculty and our high school faculty in collaborating to uh, uh, create and adopt common um, OER resources for the courses being taught um, by our high school um, faculty, those college courses. So the high school faculty and the high schools are now using the same OER materials as our college faculty are using um, in their courses at the college. And the, like that, when we, we did this, we, um, we had learning circles um, once a month and we provided lunch to our high school faculty when they came. And then while we were eating lunch, we did that sharing learning circle session um, while we just all kind of um, enjoyed lunch and coffee and talked and we shared things. And then faculty took the next two hours to um, independently work or work in groups on their OER projects. And the questions that kind of guided their um, work as they first started doing this and were new to OERs is like what OERs would they work uh, research and review? How would they evaluate them? We went through that process. Um, what are the gaps? You know, what are the differences between, um, between the college and the high school um, content? And then um, what are the gaps that they both as collaborative units saw needed to be filled? And then how would they supplement those gaps? And for, um, for the high school faculty, this also ended up because they buy textbooks for their, um, for their learners. They also, we have a print shop at Central Lakes College too, so they were able to print sets of textbooks for really, really cheap for those um, high school institutions. And so they were able to really save a lot of money on textbooks for high school students as well. And the learning circle framework for those collaborative learning circles was very much the same. But I know that many of you are involved in these concurrent enrollment projects with high schools. And I just wanted to mention how easy it is. It was easy to scale this model to the system level. It's also very easy to use this model in collaborative efforts with groups such as your high school faculty. So they did the same thing. We had a finding summit at the end. Um, we invited all their principals and superintendents to share that. Um, we had the low cost versions um, of, the, um, of the textbooks that were printed. Um, every course now will be using a OER. And let's see, where are we? So, um, so this is kind of still on that concurrent enrollment. They met five times in the semester, um, very much did the same thing that we did in our other lear learning circles. And um, much of the discussion focused on assessment outcomes and content and delivery. But another great thing that came from this collaboration was as we know that um, post-secondary instructors tend to be very much um, content educated. And our high school uh, teachers had a lot more pedagogy and instructional design um, knowledge from the courses that they took um, to become teachers. And so the fact that that was sharing was one of the things that got talked about every time we had a learning circle and every time we had a new cohort is how much our college faculty felt like they um, benefited from being able to talk to these high school faculty who had more training in pedagogy and also in instructional design. And then our college, our high school faculty felt 
they gain so much because the, their experts or work that they were working with from the college were really content area experts and could add so much to them um, in terms of those, those uh, that content area expertise. So when we talk about creating your own learning circles, um, how we have been doing at Minnesota State is we run that um, learning circle, we call it mentor mentee um, leaders um, project or pathway. And the reason we do that is because I really am really dedicated and serious about in maintaining the integrity of the process to ensure faculty success. And, and I get a little nervous sometimes when I see some of our um, colleges trying to use the learning circle model and, and if they haven't had one of their faculty go through that learning circle mentor process, some of the really important core concepts and pieces of the process get left by the side. And so I get a little bit nervous about how successful they'll be without, um, they can be flexible to make it adjust to their institution, but there's some core components that really need to be included for faculty success. So at this point, that's kind of what we're doing as we are um, working, uh, using that learning circle leader pathway where those learning circle leaders work with um, the, the learning circle facilitator, uh, much like teacher training practicums, they lead circles and learn how to do that. Monitor and respond to discussions, grade, um, do the grade the attendance discussion work plans, and create their own D2L course room. And some of the resources that you may need if you're thinking about um, doing the learning circle model and um, having learning circles take place at your institution or in your system is um, you really need to have a program to raise OER awareness. Um, for interested faculty or a way to get uh, faculty interested. And a really good place to start is that those OTN webinars. They are a great way to raise faculty awareness about open educational resources. And of course, we always need funds to pay stipends. Although I have to tell you that I have several of, I've had several faculty um, join the learning circles and refuse the stipend. They just want to have the collaboration and support um, that the learning circles offer. So I mean, this was my ultimate goal when I started this is I thought, what if, I mean, just what if, how wonderful would it be if faculty actually just wanted to come and attend these learning circles to be there for the support and whatever that's there. And that's actually happening on a, on a small level. So that's kind of exciting. But um, the last two learning circles, I've had two or three faculty just not want their stipend, um, but really want to attend the learning circles. But needless to say, we still need funds for um, faculty to be paid stipends. So um, a good way for that is to apply for grants or also to funnel some of the savings that you've had from um, the OER work that you've done back into your college or your system um, for further OER work. And that's what we do at CLC, for example. We were spending $250,000 a year on PSEO textbooks. And now with some of these OER um, resources being adopted, um, it has saved um, Central Lakes College considerable amount of money on those textbooks. So when I wrote that first grant, I asked our um, VP if she would um, return some of those savings to us. And she promised that she would, and she's done that every year. Every year it's a little bit different, but some of those savings are returned um, to continue our OER um, work at Central Lakes College. Um, librarian support is essential to any successful initiative that you have, that this is a librarian and faculty driven um, initiative. Absolutely essential to have administrative support um, to um, help facilitate all of the challenges um, that you meet in the bookkeeping end of this even um, to get that done. And it's really, really important that you have time dedicated for faculty to work on OER. So Tanya, I think I stayed within my time frame and we reached that point of questions. That being said, I want to thank all of you for being so patient and um, and um, listening for that long time while I talked.
You did great, Karen, and it's perfect timing. Um, just so you know, in the chat, we've had questions about you sharing your learning objectives matrix, um, your slides, and any templates. And one person said, too, that she would love, um, let me see. Um, yeah, I guess I'm not seeing that one. So, okay, Tanya, there uh, was the, um, sorry to interrupt, there was the learning objective matrix along yeah. with the slides and related resources, um, like modules. The modules, thank you. All the things, all the things, Karen, all the things. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is my dilemma. I, I talked already about preserving the integrity of the process and the model. And I really think that's terribly important because people tend to want to do kind of the down and dirty, quick and easy way of doing this and, and taking pieces of it. And I really feel like it has to be kind of done as a set up. So for that reason, I have written a learning circle um, guide and I, Right at this point, it's in, been loaded up into Pressbooks. BC Campus is helping me with that. I need to go in and add some screenshots to some of it. I have all of the templates, all of the narrative, all of that there already done. I haven't had time to get in and get those screenshots done. So know that there is a learning circle model guide coming out that really kind of spells out how to do all of this, provides all of the templates, all of that and it, it, show, uh, it outlines every module that you should have. I don't have that done yet, but this is what I would do is I am more than happy because it will be Creative Commons licensed. I am more than happy to like say the modules. I have that, I can copy and paste that piece of the narrative that tells you how to set those modules up. And anyone who would want to tour a course room, I'd be happy to do a tour of the course room. I knew we wouldn't have time today to show you how it's set up. So um, just email me and I will send you all of those um, resources that you would like to use. The only thing that I ask is because it is gonna be Creative Commons license. If in the meantime, you wouldn't mind giving me attribution for the, um, the resources that you use so that people, if you're using them, people know that they go with this learning circle model. That's great. Does that seem like an easy way to do it? Yeah, and do you have any idea when the BC campus, um, when that piece will be ready to share? Are you, you know, do you have a target date or not really? Yeah, I had a target date of like last March. And, um, you know, I just had some family things come up with having to care for my mom and stuff that I just haven't had a lot of time to get that done. I, I really have it as a top, top priority. So I need to connect with Lori again and see if if I could just get some help getting that piece of it done. Great, thank you so much. Are there any other questions for Karen? Any parts of it that I, because I'm familiar with it, I just kind of go over it and I may have missed, like there should be, could be some gaps in what I said that I didn't cover. I don't know if you're seeing these, Karen, but yes, it was fantastic. Impressive, great information. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, yeah, can I, Karen, can you um, tell me what your preferred email is so I can share it in the chat, please? Yep, karen.pakula mm -hmm. at minnesota.edu. Let me um, at just M -N go. State. Yep. I'm gonna just go really quick back to slide one. Don't make anybody dizzy here. <laughs> huh. And I have it in that very first slide. And these slides, I don't have a Creative Commons license on it, but I can put one on here and give it to you so that um, you can um, post these if you want to, um, Tanya or whatever. Can that you see great. that email address? Yep, and I post it in the chat as well. And then, um, yeah, once I get these slides from you, Karen, I'll, I'll make sure that we, we send the slides out. Okay, sounds good. 
Any other questions before we wrap up? I just want to thank everyone for taking time from their busy day to be here with me today. And thank you, Tanya, for asking me. Thank you, Karen. This was very, very helpful. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut the meeting down unless anybody has any other questions. Thank you for coming. Thanks again, Karen. Yep, thank you, Tanya. I'll get this to you, okay? Great, thank you.